Paul, uh, we're going to do some Q&A here, and maybe just uh, whilst we've got some microphones that we have got over there, um, maybe I'll just lead off with a question, and we had some discussions yesterday around skills in the country and how we, and how we prepare um, or use these projects that are being, being funded mm. to lift the skills in the nation. Can you perhaps say a word or two about that? And what also came out of the discussion yesterday is some concern whether, in fact, we have a skills shortage, whilst there might be plenty of jobs with the infrastructure rollout, do we have the right skills? Uh, certainly, with the unprecedented wave of infrastructure investment occurring at the moment, that does make it imperative that we have a sufficiently skilled workforce. And on major infrastructure projects, it is now standard practice to have a significant training element. Uh, that's been the case on West Connects in Sydney, which the Commonwealth Government has made a significant contribution to. Uh, it was the case on the Barangaroo project, and it will certainly be the case for uh, Western Sydney Airport, where uh, there are discussions underway with the New South Wales Government and with uh, TAFE in New South Wales about um, providing training to support the workforce. Uh, several thousand people will be working on the Western Sydney Airport project at its peak, a wide range of skills needed. It's a good opportunity to provide targeted training and also to support the entry into the workforce uh, of people who may have been out of the workforce for various reasons. We've seen that done pretty successfully on other big infrastructure projects, and it's certainly one of the social dividends that extensive public spending and infrastructure can deliver. Indeed, a, a critical topic that we have the right skills. Question in the middle, please. Thanks, Minister. I'm Christy Muir. I'm the CEO of the Centre for Social Impact. Um, thank you. That was great. I like your making cities as productive, livable and efficient as possible. And I want to just connect a couple of the points that you made. One was around, you know, the importance of connecting the train line infrastructure to jobs. Um, and the second was around employment clusters. And the third was the increase in property values around train stations and infrastructure hubs. And I'm wondering what that means around affordable housing and how we get jobs and affordable housing around lower SES communities. Thanks for the question. When we talk about new rail lines, often the assumption is this will be an efficient way to move people from the suburb that is now connected by rail to where the jobs are. But the flip side of that is once there's a station, employers know that potential employees will find it convenient to get there. And so that area uh, suddenly has some attractiveness as a place to locate businesses, which it didn't previously have. And I guess what I was arguing today is that a number of our uh, investments are targeted uh, with a view not just to where people are living, but where the jobs are, and that anywhere that's connected to rail, um, at least to some extent, has the potential to be somewhere that uh, attracts businesses and attracts employment. Um, now, on the question of uh, affordable uh, housing, um, the, obviously the Turnbull government has a, has, uh, a range of policy measures looking at housing affordability, some things we announced in the 2017 budget, including uh, measures to assist people to save for a deposit through their superannuation, measures to incent uh, people who might be living in um, larger homes at a later stage in their life to uh, downsize should they choose to do so because they can put some of the proceeds into, into superannuation, those kinds of measures. Um, certainly internationally, uh, where you see la very large urban regeneration projects, often around transport hubs, either as part of regenerating the area around an existing transport hub or as part of a design element, adding new transport into major uh, urban regeneration projects. I'm thinking of things like the, um, uh, the I don't want to get the names confused. I, I was recently at Waterfront Toronto 
uh, which has a new light rail connection to a, a new urban area. And uh, a year or two ago, I visited Riverfront, uh, the downtown Riverfront project in Portland in Oregon, uh, which is, um, the similarities actually with, between both of those projects and something like Barangaroo is quite interesting. And also um, similar projects uh, in other parts of Australia, you know, the, the common theme is land that for a century or more was industrial land on the waterfront used to support um, docks and uh, shipyards and so on. As that land is no longer being used for that purpose, um, it can be reused and often it's pretty desirable land, uh, but often there are significant transport barriers to connect to the existing urban area. Uh, but anyway, a long way of saying, in those projects around the world, um, it's not uncommon that there's an affordable housing uh, element in them. Um, and that's certainly a point that has been made to me by, amongst others, a number of large Australian corporates that have successfully been involved in uh, winning work as part of those big projects internationally. Good morning, Minister. Simon DeBell from ABB. You talked a lot about uh, heavy rail infrastructure and the importance of thinking transportation policy tying in with your city policy. As our cities become more densified, what do we need to do to start to consider uh, e-mobility, whether it's electric vehicles, electric bus or light rail, as an alternative way of helping to decarbonise our city environments? There's no doubt that the rate of technological change in the motor vehicle industry is extraordinary. I just had the chance about three weeks ago to visit San Francisco and Detroit. I was keen to get the kind of view from the new entrants and the traditional players. One of the things that struck me is how much, for example, General Motors is doing in both automated and electric vehicles. Uh, GM Cruise, which is their automated vehicle, their robo-taxi business essentially, will launch commercially in San Francisco next year. Um, and they're planning to have, I think they said it was 15 or 20 um, different uh, electric models by the um, uh, early, early to mid, um, I think they said early 2020s. Uh, so there's no doubt that we're seeing huge transformation there. Um, one of the other big takeaways for me was it's not just about the technology on board the vehicle, but it's the way that the vehicle will increasingly be connected into a broader system. Our transport system today, or certainly cars, have very little, in many ways, connectivity. They're not, they don't really operate as part of a network in a way that technology is going to allow them to in the future. And I think we'll see that becoming increasingly pervasive with each successive uh, release of, of models. Uh, interesting demonstration that highlighted to me one of the many potentials of this is um, there's a trial underway between General Motors and the Michigan Department of Transport where there's a signal, uh, uh, the traffic light has a transponder that sends a message to the vehicle. So the demonstration we were shown, the driver um, approached a red light without stopping, the car started to get warning signals, the uh, Seats started to shake and so on, audible warnings, approaching red light, approaching red light. Uh, now, the chief executive of the Michigan Department of Transport said to add those transponders in only costs, only adds about 10% to the cost of, of, um, of, of, of traffic lights. So they're increasingly starting to look at doing this as a default. But from a system-wide point of view, you've got to have the governments responsible for the roads doing their bit. You've got to have the auto manufacturers doing their bit. Uh, standards will be important not just the standards um, for the vehicles, but for the communications technology. So there's, there's a lot of potential. Uh, there's a lot happening. Um, and I think we are going to see a continued, pretty rapid rate of transformation in the, uh, in the, in the motor car. Interesting. Interesting comments. Thanks for the question. In fact, uh, the cross-modal, the need to regulate cross-mode mm. buildings, electrical system, transport is the panacea. And it requires a system and a digitalisation system that enables that communication to be laid out ahead of time. One question in the front there. Yeah, uh, Michael Hill from AECOM. Um, my question is related to land transport reform and sort of perhaps aligns to the question around 
uh, electric vehicles and the challenge with the decline in fuel excise mm. tax, which I understand you're sort of uh, certainly an advocate of, of that reform. I guess in some detail, I suppose, uh, appreciate the heavy vehicle reform is occurring. I'm really interested to see, to talk to you about the light vehicle reform and, and where that's going. It seems to me that one of the biggest challenges is the awareness in, uh, of the public about the challenge, uh, you know, and all their challenges associated with that. So my sort of question is two parts. Uh, one is uh, the rhetoric around an uh, imminent person um, and whether that is happening and when. Uh, and secondly, just talking a bit more broadly about the reform and your thoughts. Mm. Okay, for those who may not have been following the uh, policy developments in this area, the, as a nation, we spend about $25 billion a year on building new roads, on maintaining roads and on road operations. The bulk of that is funded through fuel excise, which raises about $13 billion a year. Other funding sources are the motor vehicle registration charges, um, uh, charged by the state governments, which raise several billion dollars a year, um, and a, a range of other motor vehicle related charges, such as stamp duty and so on. Now, if, as seems likely, vehicles continue to get more fuel efficient, and even more so if electric vehicles start to increase their penetration in the fleet, then the revenue stream that has funded roads for many, many years is likely to come under significant pressure. It's likely to stop growing and uh, potentially to start reducing. And so that uh, creates um, a, 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 an issue. Then we can look at, I guess, what you might describe as um, an equity or a fairness issue. If you're driving a 10-year-old Holden Commodore today, through the fuel excise system, you are paying the equivalent of about four and a half cents a kilometre to drive on our roads. That's your contribution through the uh, roughly 40 cents a litre that you're paying in fuel excise. If you're driving a uh, Prius, you're paying about one and a half cents a kilometre. Uh, and if you're one of my uh, small number of uh, prosperous constituents driving a Tesla, you're paying zero cents a kilometre through the fuel excise system to, to contribute towards the cost of our roads. So um, that raises an obvious equity issue and it's going to become a more significant issue uh, as the share of electric vehicles increases. Uh, so uh, for all of those reasons, a number of jurisdictions around the world are looking at the question of um, is the present system of funding roads sustainable and what should be done to deal with this issue? I had the chance to visit uh, California and Oregon last year. In both of those states, there have been some significant trials of uh, alternative methods uh, such as a uh, direct user charge a per, in their system, a per mile charge. Um, to use the roads, um, and Oregon, as it happens, is one of about three or four states in the US that for heavy vehicles has a um, direct user charge now. Most um, countries, most states in the US have a system similar to ours for heavy vehicles where you pay, um, a, you pay through the equivalent of the fuel excise system, but there's, one, there's two or three states of which Oregon's one uh, where well, they have a direct user charge. Uh, across the Tasman, New Zealand um, has had a, um, a system for heavy vehicle charging based upon the distance travelled uh, for 30 or 40 years. And recently, they've gone to a, an automated version of that system where you can have a device in your, in the, on the vehicle that tracks the distance the vehicle travels and... Um, uh, automatically um, identifies how much you're required to pay and there's a, uh, a, a, a sort of effectively a direct debit system where the operator makes a payment every week or every month. 
Um, so long-winded way of saying that around the world, this is an issue which governments are having a look at. Uh, Infrastructure Australia recommended in their 15-year Australian infrastructure plan, which reported um, 18 months ago or so, that the Australian government should conduct a full examination of this issue. In our response, we said that we intended to appoint an eminent Australian to have a look at the issue. This is in relation to light vehicles. Um, we also made the point that any change in this area would be a 10 to 15 year journey, and it would only happen if not just the Commonwealth, but also state and territory governments agreed, because the system uh, is, um, is a, an amalgam of, of both Commonwealth and state and territory involvement. And of course, it would only happen uh, if it could be demonstrated that the result was uh, better roads, fairer outcomes for Australians. Um, so it continues to be our intention uh, to appoint that eminent person and we'll have more to say about that um, when we get to the point of appointing that person. More questions? Perhaps I'll, I'll put one to you. We're talking about uh, what we're going to do. The how, how we're going to do it, I guess, is always uh, a good question when we look at uh, George Street in Sydney and we see it literally laid bare and dividing the city, not bringing it together. Um, Delivery models, uh, are PPPs something that uh, there's a direction away from or towards and what might we see on projects like uh, Western Sydney Airport and, and how, how do you see that being a corporation to get it built? Certainly the Turnbull government has had a strong focus on the way in which we provide investment in infrastructure. The traditional approach has been for the Commonwealth to provide grants to state governments and for state governments to manage projects. Uh, Prime Minister Turnbull has been a strong champion of other forms of investment, including equity investment. If you look at the way we're delivering Western Sydney Airport, the $5.3 billion commitment from the Commonwealth is provided in the form of an equity investment in a company, WSA Co, which has been established for the purpose of building and owning the airport. We've appointed a board of seven people, all of whom have extensive private sector experience. There's not one ex-politician on that board. Uh, the management team is full of uh, experienced uh, airport and aviation people. And that company is now charged with going out to market, uh, procuring the different uh, elements that are required. So there are fundamentally three major stages in that. The first stage is uh, the earth moving um, and the construction of the runway, the taxiways and the apron. The second stage is the design and construction of the terminal itself and the third stage is the, uh, the land side works. So that's the particular uh, procurement approach we've taken on that project and uh, certainly um, we believe that the advantage of that is having experienced private sector board and management uh, conducting a commercially rigorous process. Thanks, Paul. Any, any last questions from, from the room? I've got one down the front here, actually. Hi, Cheryl Murphy from ANZ. Um, the profile of public investment spending at the moment is, is looking pretty healthy, obviously. Um, both the Commonwealth and the state spending a lot of money all at the same time. Just sort of looking beyond that, so maybe sort of into 2021 and beyond. Um, are you concerned at all about there kind of being a bit of a lump in the economy in the sense that we get all this spending concentrated in a short period of time and then and there's sort of a downfall from there? Well, look, you've put your finger on one of the specific reasons why we've announced a 10-year infrastructure spending program in this year's budget. And we've issued uh, materials setting out project by project the expected phasing of the Commonwealth spending on those projects. Now, that's our best guess in 2018. Inevitably, that'll uh, change on a project by project basis. But in aggregate, um, we're signalling an intention to invest over a substantial period of time. And we've done that for a number of reasons. One is so that um, 
Uh, we don't see things falling off a cliff after four years. But secondly, it reflects, as I mentioned earlier, the reality of the cycles in major infrastructure projects. It takes time to plan them. It takes time to get the environmental approvals. The construction period is often three to five years. When you lay all of that out and you look at the, the pipeline of projects, it makes a lot of sense to be signalling, as the Commonwealth has done, over the next 10 years, here's the pipeline of projects we intend to fund and here's the point at which we expect to make the first payment, essentially, and here's the period over which we expect to be making that payment. The whole intention is to create greater certainty for industry participants, for state governments who are usually co-funders and typically have the project management responsibility. And so what we're seeking to do is lay out a long-term, a 10-year plan. Uh, we've pretty carefully developed the list of projects and the intention is very much to give more of a sense of not just what the next four years might hold, but going beyond that. Okay, uh, Paul, thanks very much for joining us today. Infrastructure, both uh, from the industry perspective in terms of competitiveness and efficiency, but also socially, uh, what it means for quality of life for, for all of us as Australians. Uh, your portfolio is one of the most crucial of the ones we've been discussing, and I thank you for giving us your time. Uh, round of applause, thank you. Thank you.